Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757-230-2110. writing a letter to God about what he wanted for Christmas. So he sits down and he, he writes, he goes, God, I've been a good boy for six months. And then he pauses and he realizes that's not true. So he crosses out six months. He goes, I've been a good boy for three months. That's not true either. So he crosses that out. He can think of all the things he's been doing wrong. So he goes, I've been a good boy for two weeks. And then he realizes he's hosed, it's not going to go down. So he gets up, he goes to his parents' nativity set, grabs the little Mary figure, wraps it up in a towel, puts it in the closet, goes back, sits down and says, God, if you ever want to see your mother again. <laughs> he was kind of naughty, right? How many of you have been on the naughty list this year, right? Most of you are in denial, I see. Well, Merry Christmas, and I'm glad that you're part of what, what we're doing here today. We're in a series, and if you're online uh, joining us, thank you for uh, participating with us and joining with us. We have been in a series on joy, and we're talking today about how to find joy when God uses you. Listen, if you have not sensed that God has a purpose for you, you're fulfilling that purpose, you're walking that out, you're not experiencing the kind of joy God wants you to have. And certainly we want that for you. And um, God wants to use you. Often when we talk about God using us, we often discount ourselves. We go, you know, God doesn't really want to use me. And I want to tell you if that's how you feel, I'm here to say, you're wrong. You're wrong. God wants to use you. Often we think God just arbitrarily picks people. You know, like I'll use you and you and you and the rest of you. Sorry, you know, but that's not the way it is. God's actually looking for people to use. And that is really what we see in the Christmas story. We're going to look at the Christmas story, some of the surrounding events. We see that's what God is all about, is using people that would kind of like they're ordinary, people we wouldn't normally think God would use. And we see him using people time and time again. And specifically, we see three things that that uh, in the Christmas story that God uses. He uses little problems. He uses little places and then little people. And that's what we're going to look at today. First of all, he uses little problems, little problems, little disturbances in our lives, things that we would think actually get in the way. You know, if I just didn't have these obstacles, these problems in my life, then I really could serve God. But it's actually doesn't work like that. God uses problems in our lives to catapult us into the will he has for us. He kind of uses those. He integrates those in. It's part of his will for our lives is that we have problems because he works those in. Now for Mary, she certainly had her, her, her share, fair share of problems, right? I mean, the big problem was now she's pregnant with this with the Messiah and all of the things that went around with that as well. Now, so the angels, they come. This is the Christmas story. And uh, Jesus is, is born uh, in this. He, God uses a, a virgin, right? And, she, and so an angel announces this to this virgin. Her name's Mary. And he says this, but the angel said to her, do not be afraid. Certainly there's plenty to be afraid of. Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. 
So he's going to be different than Jacob and all that have ending kings. No, his kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One will be born, uh, to be born will be called the Son of God. So here she is, she's got this new problem. And, uh, it's, but God's going to use that problem as a vehicle to further the joy in her life, to further the, her fulfilling her, her calling, what she's supposed to be doing. But it spins off in like relational problems, right? And all of a sudden now, here she is. She was engaged to be married, and it's threatening her relationship with her fiancé. She's got to go tell him. She doesn't know how that's going to go down. She's got to tell her parents. She doesn't know how that's going to go down. Probably not too good, right? I'm single. I was engaged. It's not him. It's in fact, this baby is God. And, uh, and then the neighbors, how are they going to get, you know, they're, they're like, what's up with this? These, you know, Joseph and Mary, they're in Nazareth. They're probably teasing him like, oh, here comes the godparents. <laughs> get it, right? Godparents. <laughs> you know, in other words, they're, and they're thinking, this is a dysfunctional group, right? You know, I mean, Dave, they're probably thinking Joseph's uh, codependent. He, you know, he's, he won't drop her. And they're, you know, both not agree, you know, both not owning up to it. They're, they probably tease them. And, you know, it's going to be 30 years until Jesus starts to do the miracles in that area of Galilee, validating who he is, validating what Mary and Joseph had said. <laughs> So for 30 years, they're not going to really believe him. They're going to think, you know, we don't, we don't believe you. So that's some relational problems, certainly, right? Causing some problems there. Also, you have problems traveling. You have here uh, in Luke 2, verses 1 through 5, says, In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was the governor of Syria. And everyone went to his own town to register. So Caesar, Caesar Augustus, he is the great, great uh, nephew of Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar, when he, had, uh, when he had died, they found a will. And there he had named Caesar Augustus to be the person to rule after him. And, and when he became of age. And so uh, Caesar Augustus brother-in-law Mark Anthony he was kind of a rival for ruling the Roman Empire but he got all caught up with Cleopatra and his he was he wasn't really giving his best to the affairs of Rome he was all thinking about uh, uh, Egypt and Cleopatra so he ends up getting defeated by Caesar Augustus Caesar Augustus really becomes the first Caesar of the Roman Empire and so one of his first things he does is he thinks hey I need a I need a census to figure out, you know, what's going on and start getting some, some revenue coming in. And, and so he orders this census. All of the males are supposed to go back to their hometown and register, which is what brings Mary and Joseph down to Bethlehem. That's, that's, that's kind of the backdrop of that. So Joseph also went up to the town of Nazareth of Galilee. Now, if you know uh, on a map how that looks, he's actually going south. So we would call it down, but they're in elevation, they're going up. So that's why it says they went up to the town of Nazareth, uh, fr from Nazareth to Galilee, to Judea, to Bethlehem, to the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He was there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. So she's nine months pregnant. She's probably in her 40th week. Now listen, today, if you were in your 40th week of pregnancy and you were going to travel somewhere a long way, they have like travel restrictions, right? Wouldn't the doctor say, well, you probably shouldn't be flying, right? Or maybe you, you probably shouldn't travel at all. What if you were, to, you were nine months pregnant and you go to your doctor and you say, you know, I'm thinking of taking like a five, six day trip uh, on, you know, like through the mountains. And uh, I might, you know, I might ride a donkey. That's going to be better, you know. You're probably going, well, that's not any better. How about if I get in a cart, you know, that, you know, that pulls me, that's got no shock absorbers? No, nah, it's probably, I mean, here it's inconvenient, right? It's probably the rainy season. It's probably cold. And they could be thinking to themselves, hmm, this sure would have been better if this census had come up a year before or maybe a year later. But it's now, like, the worst possible time for us, Right? See, problems 
or part of God's will for our lives. They're integrated in. Sometimes they're, they seem like they're really inconvenient, but it's certainly part of what God does to, to, uh, to, to further his will in our lives. Now, Mary, she didn't get focused on her problems. She didn't let her problems control her. She focused on the promises that God had. Mary said, I am the servant, the Lord's servant. I am willing to do whatever he wants. Circle that word, whatever. May everything you said come true. So whatever you want, that's, you know, what, what, is, what does that include? Whatever. It includes everything, right? God, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to embrace that. I'm going to walk in that. Mary quietly treasured these things in her heart and thought about them often. So as you can see the focus, she's not thinking about the problem. She's thinking about the promises. God's going to do something through this. You know, you can focus on the problems all day long, but she chose not to. Now here, here's the thing. If you're going to do something for God, if, you're, if 2019 is going to look different for you than, than 2018, it means it's going to cost something, right? I mean, following God's plan, following God's will for your life, there's a cost that goes with it. Certainly Mary paid that cost. And, and many, many people all throughout the Bible, you see him paying the cost throughout church history. There's a cost to follow God. And some of you, you that's... It's time for you to up the ante. Now, you know, we start the beginning of our years, of, of the year in January here in, in uh, Vineyard with 21 days of prayer and fasting. One of the reasons we do that is because we're, we're kind of positioning ourselves for we want more of God. And there's no better way to do that than through prayer. And then the Bible talks about fasting. That means you're kind of like dying to your flesh somewhat. You know, especially around holidays, right? We just... We don't die to our flesh too much during the holidays, right? All the Christmas cookies and all. So it's a good time to kind of say, hey, I'm going to kind of rein things in a little bit. We're going to do that together as a church on this program called The Daniel Plan, where it focuses in on our mind, uh, we focus on our body, we focus on relationships and on God. And so we're going to kind of bring these things together and we're going to do them for 21 days. And I'm encouraging you to do it with us. Do it with us. Come ready. Hey, I'm, 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 I'm going to get focused. I want 2019 to look different. Now, for some of you, 2018 looked different than 2017 because you stepped up to the plate. Some of you have been attending church more than you've ever attended before. Some of you got involved in the covenant that we did together at the beginning of 2017 where we said, hey, we're going to do three things. We're going to get in a small group. We're going to start giving regularly. We're going to pray regularly and get into God's word. And you agreed to that, and you said, hey, and I said, I'll pray for you every day. And we had a team of people praying for you every day, and we have been. And some of you saw your lives really, really change because of that. You said, hey, I got, I'm, getting, I'm going forward with God. Some of you got involved in growth track, and you took step one, two, three, and four, and then you got involved on the dream team. You're serving, you're using your gifts, you're furthering the kingdom of God on a team. And God's, you're seeing the results of that. God's doing something in your life. Listen, 2019 can be different for you. God wants to use you, but it will cost you something. It really will. And so you've got to decide kind of, do I want that? Do I want, am I, how am I going to react? The problems will be part of it. But you say, hey, I'm going to commit up front. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going for what God has for me. That certainly is the, the message here we see in this story here, the first Christmas. Secondly, so God uses little problems. He also uses little places. And we see this here really well uh, in Bethlehem. Bethlehem is a little place. It's a little village. It says, while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. As I said, Bethlehem's a very small uh, town. Uh, and, and, uh, and we know Joseph is a carpenter, right? He, Jesus was a carpenter as well. He learned that from, his, from, from, from Joseph. Jos now, carpenters, we often think that carpenters, you know, build homes. And they do, you know, build homes. And they would build them out of, out of wood and mud and stone. Uh, but the term, the word that's used for carpenter in the New Testament is tecton, and that's a different kind of carpenter. That kind of carpenter uh, makes um, like hand tools for farm gear, farm equipment. Also, they would make um, 
uh, uh, yokes that would be on uh, animals and plowing. That was, it was more like a handyman. And so often, you know, a handyman was somebody who lived in, in, in a small village like that on a very modest income and in a very modest home. And the homes were small. You know, the homes in Bethlehem were, were very small, especially from the, the, the modest or the, pe- the, the income and the peasants. Uh, their home actually could fit in some of your master bedrooms, their entire home. I mean, they had this little teeny place where the family would gather. The kitchen was often the same as the living room and, you know, all of that. The dining room it was all one little room. And then they, they, they might have an, an extra uh, room. And then if they, were, if they were lucky, they had like a loft, which was called the guest room. And, and that's where like kids would sleep. And, and uh, if they had guests, of course, come over, that's where they would sleep. And then in Bethlehem, there's a lot of caves and they would build their homes over the caves if they could, because then it added like another layer. They could have like a basement. That would often be where they would put the, the animals. It was became uh, the place where all the animals lived. <clears throat> almost like a garage or a, or, or a basement. And so the tradition says that that's, that, the, they, that uh, Joseph and Mary, Joseph's family, Joseph's parents, had their home built over a cave like that. So when Mary and, and uh, Joseph come, they're pregnant, she's in labor, it's, it's, they show up in Bethlehem, that's where they went. They didn't go to an inn. An inn, it's off, there's a different word for inn, but and there's no inn in a little village of you know 100 200 homes it was just people's homes and they went to joseph's home and the room there's guest there's no room in the guest room there's already all of his siblings were there there's like 10 15 people all sprawled out in this little home they're on the floor there's no room for mary mary's going to go into labor there's going to you know the bodily fluids everywhere it's going to be unclean it's it, it just they just said why don't we just clean up a little place down in where the animals are down in the basement and we'll put mary down there a little more privacy certainly that's where she would have gone and so that's where she had her baby a very humble place but you still think about it i mean jesus was born with the animals like in a i mean if if you think about it here as christ followers as christians we believe that god sent his son jesus christ here it's it's god in the flesh he's a special baby and he's born among animals you think couldn't he have like you know orchestrated where they bump into somebody and they go hey you don't have to stay here i've got a beautiful home in jerusalem that's not far away it's only a few miles away i'll take you there you can you can have the house for a week you know my blessing to you i mean why didn't he couldn't he have done that well he could have right since he could have then the question is why didn't he well, it's because it's God's expressed intention to not do that. He wanted him born in a little place, in a place that's lowly, in a place just among animals. And then Jesus was put in a, in a manger, which is this, um, which is a, uh, like a little crib, right? It's a little crib. Just puts him in this crib. Crib actually is, comes from the old English word, which is animal trough. And the cribs today have slats. And that actually comes from the animal trough of, of yesteryear where the animals would eat the hay and uh, the feed and pull it through those slats. And so those slats we have in cribs, baby cribs today, really just are to remind us of, of, of the anim, of this story. But the actual cribs of those days, archaeologists have found, it really didn't look like that at all. It would look more like this. This one here was in Megiddo, but they're found all throughout Israel. That is an actual manger. That's a crib of their day. It was made of stone. And they would still put hay in there. They would still put straw. And then the baby would be in there. But it's still an animal trough. And so Jesus was placed in this animal trough. I mean, that's a pretty lowly place, right? I mean, it's a little place. And yet, and yet God demonstrates that it doesn't matter where you come from, right? Some, all of us have different starting places here in this room. All of us have different starting places. And those who are watching online, we have different places we come from. It doesn't matter. God can still use you. That certainly is the message of the Christmas story. In fact, Luke mentions this three times, that Jesus is born in a manger. I mean, in an animal trough. In an animal trough. We see that God uses, all throughout the Bible, people that come from lowly places. David, who is the king of Israel, was found on the hillside tending sheep. Saul was found among some luggage hiding at a festival. Moses was on a desert alone. Gideon, 
He said, who's Gideon? Some of you guys will go, hey, I know Gideon. He's the guy who wrote those Bibles in all the hotel rooms. <laughs> well, that's actually he is, Gideon was, was, was a guy that God used, but he was found in a wine press. Wine presses in those days were, were, were a place where you would hide. I mean, or they were underground. He was using it to hide. Amos and Elijah, two prophets found on a farm. Peter, Andrew, James, John, apostles of Jesus. They were just fishing. D.L. Moody, one of the great soul winners of last century, he was found in the back of a shoe shop. And William Carey, the first modern missionary, was found in a shoemaker shop as well. So you find over and over God uses people and, and, and who are in ordinary places. And really, we are the manger. God just, we're just an ordinary vessel that God wants to come and use in a powerful way. Here's a, listen to this poem. Father, where shall I work today? And my love flowed warm and free. And he pointed out a tiny spot and said, tend that place for me. I answered him quickly, oh, not that. Why, no one would ever see. No matter how well my work was done, not that little place for me. The word he spoke then wasn't stern. He answered me tenderly. Nazareth was a little place, and so was Galilee. See, we have to be willing to say, if God places me in a small place, if that's where I found myself, God can use that. When we started our church 24 years ago, we just started in our garage, and it, there was nothing special about that. And then in some, some schools and in the cinema cafe. And I would remind myself of this verse. A very, very encouraging verse for me. It says, do not despise the day of small things or small beginnings. Sometimes we start in a place of small beginnings. And people would ask, and still do, you know, hey, so what's special about your church? And I can tell you it's not the pastors. It's not this, this great building. It is the good news. That's why we're committed to talking and sharing the good news. People love good news. Especially, you know, I mean, as things get darker and darker, you watch TV. As the worse things get, the better the good news gets. People love good news. And it's the good news that makes a difference. It says, we are here to announce the good news to turn you away from the worthless things to the living God who made heaven, earth, sea, and all that is in them, who fills your hearts with happiness. You know what the good news is? The good news is simple. It's you matter to God. You were not born by accident. That God has a plan for you and he cares for you and he wants you to know him as well as he knows you. And in order to do that, he sent his son, Jesus Christ, so that you could know what God is like. And as you start to read the gospels, you start to, to uh, discover who Jesus is. You invite Christ into your life. It transforms your life and you start to, you start to connect with God in a way that you never understood before. That's the good news. And that's the good news that God has for you. So God uses little problems. He uses little places in your life. And then God uses little people. Now, I'm not talking about short people. He does use short people. I'm a testimony to that. But little people more like, you know, like lowly people, humble people, people that you wouldn't expect. Luke 2, verses 8 through 12 says this says, and there were shepherds. Those are some little people. We'll talk about them in just a second. There were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring to you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. So here the angels declare the good news. To who? Well, to shepherds, right? They go to the shepherds. Now, these are little people, right? I mean, the angels, here it is. The Son of God is being born. It's a big day. And they don't go to the palaces and tell the kings and the nobles. They don't go to the staterooms and tell the politicians and the governors. And they don't go to the wealthy and the, go to the business uh, forums and tell them. No, they go, to, they go to the shepherds. Now, the shepherds, actually a lot like today in the Middle East, shepherds are on the lower end of the socioeconomic uh, uh, scale. They're down there, right? Kind of modest very modest. And even within shepherds, you know, there's, there's like a distinction 
two different types of shepherds. There's kind of like some are, have a little higher status than others. The day shift and the night shift. Now, which one do you think has the higher, sh- the higher status? Day shift, right? Day shift, a little higher. You're, I mean, you know, you're, you're talking to shepherds now, but to them it, makes, it means something. So, and God goes to the night shift ones, to the lowest of the low, and he proclaims the good news. See, he goes to little people, people you wouldn't expect. You think, out of all the people, this is who God goes to, and he does. He goes to her, now, goes to him. And now, he also goes to Mary. We read that earlier. Goes to Mary, and Mary's, you know, a little person. She's, I mean, what's special about Mary? You know, there's misunderstanding about Mary. Some people think, you know, uh, we're supposed to worship Mary. But you know, the Bible never says that, that Mary's God, that we're supposed to worship her or venerate her, that she was sinless or perfect. The Bible doesn't say any of that. In fact, that what makes Mary so special that we see in Scripture is, is that she was so ordinary and God still used her. That's what makes her special. It certainly was not her education because she didn't have any. It wasn't her wealth because she was poor. It wasn't because she was mature because she was a teenager. Mary was special because she was a little person. She was humble. She was just an ordinary person, which really says something about who God chooses. He looks for the ordinary person. He looks for people just like you. When God chose to slay Goliath, who did he use? A great mighty soldier? No, a kid. David. Gideon. I mentioned him earlier. Defeated the Midianites. Gideon, you know, was a kid. He was a runt. He was a runt kid and a runt family and a runt tribe and a runt, runt nation. So I just figured when God was deciding who he needed, he thought, I just want, I, I, I need a runt. Right? I'm, I'm looking for somebody little. When uh, in 2 Kings chapter 5, Naaman has leprosy. And somebody informs him there's somebody who could heal him. Elijah, the prophet, do you know who it was? His little maiden servant, a little girl. The person who saw the first resurrected Christ, was it the wealthiest woman in Jerusalem? No, it was Mary Magdalene. She had been possessed by seven demons. And then Samson, I love Samson. You know, in the movies, whenever they talk about, you know, whenever they depict Samson, he's always like, you know, pretty muscular right it's like a jewish rambo or something you know just like oh this dude's just can crush anybody but they were always surprised at his at his at his strength they didn't know where it came from now if he was ripped they would have said well of course you know he hits the gym every day that's why you know he's that's why that's where his strength comes from but he he's like he was probably thin he probably looked like mr bean or somebody you know and they're thinking can't be his muscles because he doesn't have any so they get delilah and they're saying trying to figure out where his strength comes you know where it comes from it turns out it's from the spirit of the lord right spirit of the lord they didn't get that though so it's here it is a little person we try to project that in no no he can't be a little person he's got to be a big person you see you can't be too little for god to use you but you can be too big you can be too big for yourself, too big for your mind. Oh, I can be. And you want to never overestimate what you can do without God. We tend to do that. I can do this, I can do that with all my talent, all my strength. But don't underestimate what you can do with God. Because God and you makes a powerful team. And so certainly there's, there's we, all have, we all have challenges that we try to discount ourselves and say, oh, I can't do anything for God. I mean, I have all these problems. You know, I'm too old. Well, so was Abraham and Sarah, right? Or I'm too young. The prophet Jeremiah was young. I have physical limitations. I, I, you know, I have these uh, physical challenges. Well, so did Paul, and God used him. I have infirmities. I'm always sick. Well, so is Timothy. God used him. I can't talk real well. It's who God chose when he chose Moses. To go and confront Pharaoh, a talking position. Let's find some guy who can't talk real well. I've disappointed God. Well, who disappointed God more than Peter? Peter here, the Bible tells us that he denied Christ three times. Jesus is being tried, and he's around a fire, and people say, hey, you knew, you, I've seen you with Jesus. And he denies him. Now, Jesus told him he'd do that. He said, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows, before the morning comes. 
And, and he goes, no, no, I won't. And he does. Here, on his third time, he actually curses and swears. Now, we, in our imagination, we think, oh, like a string of profanity like a sailor, right? Because Peter was a sailor, by the way. <laughs> but actually, what that means is he, like, called down a curse on himself. He was, like, saying, hey, God damn me if I, if I, if I ever knew this person, because I didn't. This is, what he's, this is what's going on here. And then Jesus goes and he restores him. Now, maybe that was you. Maybe, maybe you've denied God. Maybe you're somebody who's cursed God and distanced yourself. Maybe you didn't stick up for him when, when you know you should have. And then we you know, live a life filled with shame and embarrassment. We need God's grace in our life. We need, a, we need a reboot. But here's the thing. It says God uses us no matter what we've done, where we've been. That's what makes us little people is our mistakes, our challenges, the things that we find ourselves in. Listen to this. It says, he was born in an obscure village, the child of a peasant woman. He grew up in a, an obscure village where he worked as a carpenter until he was 30. Then for three years, he was an inert preacher. He never, went, he never had a family or owned a home. He never set foot inside a big city. He never traveled 200 miles from the place he was born. He never wrote a book or held an office. He did none of those things that usually accompany greatness. While he was still a young man, the tide of popular opinion turned against him. His friends deserted him. He was turned over to his enemies and went through a mockery of a trial. He was nailed to a cross between two thieves. While he was dying, his executioners gambled for the only piece of property he had, his coat. When he was dead, he was taken down and laid in a borrowed grave. Twenty long centuries have come and gone, and today he is the central figure for much of the human race. All of the armies that ever marched, and all of the navies that ever sailed, and all of the parliaments that ever sat, and all of the kings that ever reigned, put together have not affected the life of, man, of, the life of man upon this earth as powerfully as this one solitary life. One person. And that was the person who was born in a little place with and, and it, it, all of us can be in that situation see the good news I want to I want to close with this verse it says the angel said the, I bring good news of great joy to all people that means to all of us to you is born this day in the city of David key, two key words here a savior who is the Messiah the Lord a savior now, sometimes we hear that, a Savior, and, and he says, that's good news. You have been born a Savior. We, we need a Savior, but sometimes we don't feel like we do, right? I mean, we're thinking, hey, do I really need a Savior? I've got, I've got things are going on pretty well for me. I've got a good job. I have a two-car garage. I have a nice family. I've got my health. I mean, do I really need a Savior? And we kind of, right? And then it's not really good news for us. But here's what I've discovered is that we do need a Savior, we do. The, the word Savior is like deliver. Do we all need deliverance from something? I've lived here since 1987. I moved from Arizona. I've been here for quite a while. Talked with thousands and thousands of people in the Southampton Roads area. And I found that all kinds of different people need different types of deliverance. Some people need deliverance from narcissism. They're just consumed with themselves in their own, their own lives. Some people need deliverance from materialism. They're just, it's all about getting more stuff. Maybe I'll, that's, that's what I need to make me feel better about myself. And they lay that, the, maybe their family's on the altar of that, or their kids, and they live for work. There's people that need deliverance from that. There's people that need deliverance from addictive things. They're addicted to sex, or they're addicted to, to, uh, to drugs, or they're addicted to porn, or they're addicted to shopping. There's all kinds of things. And those things, addictions that go out of control, they just kind of run us right into the gutter and we end up losing things all around us. We need deliverance from that. There's people that need deliverance from anxiety. There's people that need deliverance from, from uh, depression. There's certainly people that need deliverance from sin. You go, Andy, that sounds pretty rough. Well, sin means that this is what it means to be a human being. And then we're kind of living off kilter. We're over here. And we've all been in that place. And we feel guilty. We feel bad about it. And we need grace and forgiveness for that. And then we certainly all need deliverance from the weight of death that is 
coming our way, all of us. And so this is, what it, this is the good news. That if we're really willing to own it, what we need to be delivered from, this is what God saves us from through Jesus Christ. And then he says, not only a Savior, but then he says, a Lord. Now, Lord's different. Now, Lord is often misunderstood, right? People think different things with what Lord is. But when the term was used with the angels in that day, the Lord that was was known was Caesar Augustus. He called himself Lord. He, He considered himself a God. He wanted people to worship him. He had it on his coin that that Caesar is Lord. And he he required people to say that. And Christians that would not say Caesar is Lord, and they would say Jesus is Lord, they were thrown to lions, they were burned at the stake, they were thrown into the galley uh, to fight uh, gladiators. All because of their, there was a test. They said, no, that's that's not who Lord is for me. Lord, Lord, kurios, that Greek word means number one. Calling the shots, the boss. And Jesus, see, is the greatest Lord in the land. That was the declaration. Even bigger than Caesar, it's Jesus. And so we certainly need deliverance, but we need need a Lord in our life. Now, what does it mean to have Jesus as Lord in your life? Well, it means first of all that you acknowledge that Jesus Christ is God. Not just a prophet, not just a good guy, not a moral guy. No, he's God. And you know, the Bible emphasizes that over 600 times in the New Testament, it calls Jesus Lord. And then it also means that I'm willing to submit my life to him. That God's got a greater plan than I have for my own own life. Now here's the, it's Christmas time, right? Let me give you some gift ideas. A gift for yourself. Open up the gift, recognize that God wants to use you. You're an, as an ordinary person with all your foibles, all your problems, the good, the bad, the ugly, God loves you. And just receive that. A gift to others is to live for somebody other than yourself next year, all next year. See, I'm going to live, I'm going to put other people, and I'm going to serve them. I'm going to put other people first. I know that doesn't sound politically correct these days, but that's to say I'm going to serve other people for Christ's sake. And then a gift for God is to say, God, I'm going to open up my life to you. Uh, My heart will be that manger. You can reside here. Okay? Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord, we celebrate the message of joy. Good news of great joy to all people. That includes everybody here. Everybody listening online good news of great joy to all people. First of all, he says, a Savior was born. Would you say, God, deliver me. Help me to see that I really do need deliverance. I need a Savior. I need something beyond myself to help me to accomplish what my life's purpose is. And would you say, God, use me. Use the difficulties in my life. Help me to not focus on those, on the problems, but on the the plan, the purpose, and the promises that you have for me. You say, God, use the little place that I find myself in. Help me not to despise small beginnings. Help me to recognize that you're you're, going to integrate your will into that. And then say, God, help me to be one of those little people that I'm not too big to be used. If you've never surrendered your life to Christ, if you've never said, yes, I want him as my Lord, why not do that right now? This Christmas, say, just pray with me right where you're at. Just whisper, say, dear God, come into my life. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, as Savior and Lord for me. Today, put your spirit in me. Let me be that ordinary vessel that you live through. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Thanks for tuning in to today's message. If God is impacting your life through this ministry, join us in reaching others by investing today. You can give by texting your donation amount to 757-230-2110 or by going to vineyardchurch.com slash give. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an update. We'll see you next week.